So we were going to do this anyway, um, but I was working with a client yesterday um, and she has been through loads of therapeutic interventions and she got really stuck on something because okay. every in therapeutic intervention she'd been through had asked her to look back, when did your problem start? When did this emetophobia start? When did you start feeling this way? What was it that happened in the past that kicked all of this off? And she was getting really stuck on the on the notion that everything that she could possibly relate it to, her brother had been through the exact same thing, but he didn't have emetophobia. So her question was, well, why me? Why have I got it and why hasn't he? So I thought that would be a nice one to dive into today as to why it's not about the past. Okay, lovely. <laughs> so I don't know why we've left it this long to do this, and it's entirely my fault. But this whole notion about the past, or, or as we talk about it in the manuals at the moment, it's not about the past, is probably the most important thing we should have ever told any metaphor. Mm. Okay, so I apologise. Mm. And do you know what? It's not really even in the manual yet. It's only been in the Thrive Manual, I think, probably for for a, a year. But, but we've been updating the meta manual for so long, um, the new version out very, very soon. So... Almost everybody, it doesn't sound very really scientific, does it? Almost everybody. I'm trying to think, <laughs> if, if, if you ask anybody, right, most people believe that their past and what's happened in their past mm -hmm. and their past experiences, their, their past memories and the stress and trauma and, and, and growing up and parenting and all this stuff has a massive impact upon their future. In fact, one of the questions in our TQ quiz is how much you believe it predicts your future. And it's the only question in the whole 50 question space quiz where like 95% of people agree with it. Yeah. Um, and and, and I, was, I was looking for today, every quote I could find by every renowned therapist and psychologist, all of them talk about your problems being rooted in the past. Okay, it's all about the past. And, and if you think about uh, counselling, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, hypnotherapy, analytical therapy, all of these things are focused on you going back to your past and revisiting experiences and memories and rehashing these and talking through you're bullied at school right you've got social anxiety now as an adult because you're bullied at school you're going to spend six months talking through those experiences yeah. where you were bullied and how did you feel how did it make you feel and what was said and how did you get around and all this stuff right so there's a lot of narrative in the english language about the fact that our past plays a massive effect or has a massive effect upon us now yeah and the thing is it's just not true Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just not true. A and it's totally untrue. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not, this isn't a grey area. It's totally untrue. Okay, yes. to the point that when I, uh, when I put this in the Ameto uh, manuals, which I'm r busy writing now, I've changed the name of it slightly. Okay, so I'm not going to call it anymore. You didn't know this. I'm not going to call it anymore. It's not about the past. I've mm -hmm. got to look at it. It's called now a clean slate. Okay. AKA your past doesn't have to dictate your future. Nice. Okay. Mm. If you think about locus of control for a minute, and we think about how powerful we feel, mm -hmm. and of course the Thrive Program in essence is about feeling as powerful as you can in, in, in your life or as many different situations, the more powerful you feel, the calmer, the happier, the more contented, the more skillful you feel, etc. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest areas in which people give their power away is believing that their past is driving or dictating how they feel or experience now. For example, I've got a terrible phobia of dogs because I was attacked by a dog when I was 10. Yep. 
okay and mm -hmm. every therapist i've been to everyone you speak to when you say off oh, i'm 50 now i've got this terrible phobia of dogs I, I i even worry walking down the street some days in case i see a dog or hear a dog barking i just oh instantly feel agitated and stressed they all say it's because you were attacked as a kid okay yeah. somehow that memory is still there the trauma of it's still there you know you haven't processed it properly it's still inside you uh, and whenever you see or hear a dog now, your brain immediately goes back to that time when you were 10 when you attacked by that dog. It's unresolved. There's muscle memory. It's flashbacks. It's whatever. Okay. Yep. None of which is true. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's just completely untrue. Okay. The, the narrative on that is completely inaccurate. Okay. And this mm -hmm. takes a few minutes to get. Okay. So I apologize. So the point here is this is a really disempowering narrative yep. to believe that something you've got right now that you want to change is somehow caused in the past and is, is somehow stuck there and there's nothing you can do about it other than go through lots of therapy and try and resolve it by finding it and talking through it, something like that, okay? So first of all, We've got to think a little bit about memory. There's two parts to this. One is thinking about the actual memory side of things. And then the other part is the emotional side of things. Okay. So first of all, if you were to think about memories, okay. Yeah. Think to memories. Think about you're married, aren't you? I am. Okay. So you think about your wedding day. As mm -hmm. I say to you, think about your wedding day. You get a picture in your mind about your wedding day and you have a big smile on your face. That's because you're happily married, right? Yeah, happily okay. married, If yeah. you think about your four previous husbands, right, and the horrible <laughs> traumatic divorces, you wouldn't have a smile on your face, would you? Okay. Nope. So I ask you to think about it. The, the, the memory comes into your mind and mm -hmm. uh, puts a little smile on your face, okay? Mm -hmm. So it feels yeah. like, it feels like, and I talked about this for years when I was a psychotherapist, right? It feels like we somehow have like a, a storage cabinet in the back of our mind, a bit like the storage cabinet people might have in their office, right, with loads of files in. You've got a storage cabinet in the back of your mind with all of these memories in, mm -hmm. okay? And I mentioned one, and you go to that file, you pick it out, and there it is, right? There's the picture, just as you saw it back then. That's how it feels. Yep. And in, in just about every language, all the narrative surrounding that, backs that up, okay, in terms of talking about the fact that our memories are stored photos somewhere, a bit like if you go on your iPhone and you bring out that photo of your wedding day, there's that stored photo, it's there all along, all you've got to do is find it in the filing cabinet, ping, there it is, okay, and, and the feeling that that happens validates for the person their belief that it's about the past. Mm. Okay, so go back to my analogy of uh, uh, having a phobia of dogs because I was attacked by a dog when I was 10. If you ask me, think about that dog, Rob, that picture comes into my mind, okay? And as the picture comes into my mind, I don't smile the way you smiled thinking about your wedding day. I cringe and think, oh my God, that dog, mm. and it's big mm -hmm. teeth, and I'm only a little boy, and it feels terrifying. The fact that I look back to that memory and drag that photo up and all the emotions that seem to be attached to it, okay, and I feel frightened and anxious thinking about it, validates my belief that it was that all those years ago, 40 years ago, that caused my phobia. And it validates my belief that somehow that memory and all the emotions are kind of there in the back of my mind somewhere any time they can come to my mind, which makes me feel powerless and out of control. You know, I could be talking to you now and I hear a dog bark outside and I'm going to tense up because yeah. immediately hearing that dog barking reminds me of that memory being attacked by that dog when I was 10. And again, I, I, I tense up and, and I shake and I feel anxious and, and all these emotions and these feelings and everything else, right? So mm -hmm. all of this continues to validate my belief that my current phobia of dogs that's ruining my life is caused what was caused 
by being attacked by the dog when I was 10. And that, that memory, the recording of that event is somehow in the back of my mind, mm -hmm. ready to be triggered off at the slightest hint of anything to do with dogs. And there's nothing I can do about it. I, uh, and there's, there's no way of resolving it. And I'm 50 now and I've had that for 40 years and it's not getting any less. So I feel completely disempowered by it. Yeah, I've talked it through with various therapists and the phobia is still there. Mm -hmm. I've tried hypnotherapy, I've tried drugs, I've tried everything on the planet to resolve this massive phobia I've got and nothing helps. Well, really, the reason nothing helps is because the story that I believe about why I've got my phobia is just not true. Yeah. Okay, it's just not true. So first of all, we do not store memories. Okay, mm -hmm. let me find a picture. I've got a picture. No, I don't. Okay, we do not store memories. Okay, there is no filing cabinet. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is no filing cabinet. There is no safe. There is no chest of drawers. Okay, that picture that you just had of your wedding day and the picture I have, fictional picture I have of being attacked by a dog, OK, that picture is not just sitting there back here somewhere waiting for me to draw it forward. Mm -hmm. Like your wedding day picture might be on your iPhone It's sitting there right now. Anytime you want to skim through your photos. There it is. OK, it's sitting there the whole time. You're just not looking at it right now, but it is there. OK. In your head, it isn't. Yeah. There's nowhere in your brain where you store pictures or memories. It doesn't exist. OK. Mm -hmm. So what happens is how we have these things, how we know these things, what we do store is somewhere between about 5 and 10% of a memory, okay, mm -hmm. of an experience. Mm -hmm. And usually that's just information about it. So little bits of information like you know you're married, you know it's at St. Peter's Church, you know you wore white, you know that Richard was there, right? And you knew that the whole family was there and it's a lovely sunny day, okay? Mm -hmm. And then from that knowledge, you recreate that image, okay? It's a reconstruction. It's not an original. If I ask you to think again now, Michelle, of your wedding day, okay, mm -hmm. that's a reconstruction. That's not the same picture you had four minutes ago. Every time I ask you to think about it, you are very, very quickly, I mean, very, very quickly, painting that picture anew, Every single time you picture it. Yep. Every time you picture that in your mind, you've just created it new. Because it doesn't exist in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. You're painting a picture. If we could completely slow down your brain, okay, mm -hmm. and record what you're seeing in real, real slow-mo, when I say, right, Michelle, think about your wedding day, what you're doing is going, oh, my wedding day, it was sunny, Rich was there, blah, 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 blah. And you're quickly painting this picture and going, boom, that's what's happening. You're constructing it. And when you stop thinking about it, it disappears. It doesn't go back here. It disappears again. Yep. Okay? Yep. So what we do, we store little bits of information uh, in brain neurons. We store it as, as electrical activity yep. in brain neurons. And a brain neuron is, is about a tenth the size of a millimeter. OK, so a tiny, tiny, tiny little neuron in your brain has some little electrical charges. Okay? There's no pictures or videos or emotions. They just connect together. Said, oh, yeah, you were married on that day. Richard was there. It was a lovely day and gives you some information about that. And then you quickly paint that picture. Yeah. OK, I feel in so the if rest, that yeah. picture isn't a lovely picture of your wedding day, but is, in fact, an image of you being attacked by a pit bull. Mm -hmm. That image didn't exist a minute ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how could it possibly be plaguing you all your life? Mm -hmm. Okay, until I, <coughs> excuse me, until I ask you to think about it, it doesn't exist. So this is so, so important because our beliefs are linked to the fact that somehow this memory or this experience is bottled up. It's in the back of our mind bothering us all these years later. And it isn't. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist until you create it. Yeah. If I say, if I picked on another, think about the holiday you had last year mm -hmm. and you picture something in your mind from your holiday, anything mm -hmm. at all, don't tell us, mm -hmm. right? Picture it in your mind. 
that picture did not exist in your mind 20 seconds ago. You've thought, oh, what do I do on my holiday? And you've painted that picture. So that yeah. picture wasn't there bothering you at some unconscious level. The picture wasn't there with loads of emotions just waiting in that filing cabinet when you open it to come out. It didn't exist. Yeah. All there is in relation to it was the knowledge that you are married, that it was a lovely day, that Auntie Claire was there, etc. cetera. That, that's all there was. The memory didn't exist, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So to think that for emetophobes, for example, all those memories of times when they've been anxious or all those memories they think of when they were sick or anything else are somehow bothering them isn't true. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're yeah. not bothered, but it isn't the memories. Yes. Okay. Because the mm -hmm. memories don't exist. The pictures don't exist mm -hmm. until you draw them afresh every single day. Yeah. Okay. And if some people that are listening to this, watching this, are thinking that that's hard to get their heads around, think about this for a second. Let me ask you to do something, okay? Think about something that you can talk about legally on a podcast, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. That you did in the last couple of weeks, okay? Yeah. Anything at all. Can you tell us what, you, what was it you thought of? Oh, yeah. Uh, I went for a walk to feed the ducks with my daughter and my husband last weekend. Fab. Okay. Now you didn't think about all of that. You just give me an overview, okay, mm. of the whole event, right? Mm. Which probably took two hours. You thought of four or five seconds, or, or you just had a picture. Mm. You had a picture in your mind, did you? Yes. It was. It was me what? on the platform with my daughter feeding the ducks. You on the platform feeding the ducks. Mm. Okay. So I ask mm. you to think of a memory from last week, mm -hmm. and it's you on the platform feeding ducks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you see you on the platform feeding ducks? I think I did because there's pictures of it and I'm I'm remembering that picture. So I'm sort of okay. like that's and then I constructed it around that and the feelings. But yes, I think I did. Uh, okay. But you saw yourself mm -hmm. feeding ducks. Mm. Let's do a different one. Let's think about something else in the last few weeks, something you don't yeah. have photos of, so that we okay. know you're only thinking of it now. Yeah, okay. Okay, what's the picture? Um, I'm in my grandma's living room with my daughter, playing with the blocks. Okay, okay. So describe what you're seeing to me. Describe the picture you're seeing to me. Are you seeing your grandmother? Are you seeing the furniture? Are you seeing you? What are you seeing? The furniture, the blocks, my hand, daughter, okay. grandma on the couch over here. Okay, so the first time I asked you to think of a memory, you saw yourself in the memory in the third person. I did, yeah. And this time you're not, okay? Yeah. So a third a third of the um, listeners or viewers of this, if they think now of something they did last week and they get a picture in their mind, a third of people will see it in the third person, okay? Mm. Mm -hmm. Regularly, okay, all the time. Right. See yourself in the third yeah. person. Most people, most people do it from time to time. A third of people do it every time, okay? Right, okay. Now, clearly, that can't be a memory. No, Excuse me. that can't be true. That can't, it can't be a memory. It can be true. No. Mm. Okay, it can be true. It can be true that you fed the ducks with your daughter last week, right? I believe you, okay? Yeah, but okay. I couldn't see it from that angle. can't be a memory but, of it. But it can't be a memory of it, okay? Mm. And yet, you would swear under oath that was a memory. I tell you, you saw that's a memory. So, yes, Rob, I see it clearly in my mind. Of course. Mm -hmm. But it can't be you remembering the actual event mm -hmm. unless you were sitting on the ceiling watching another version of you being there right you yeah, can't yeah. see yourself in the third person mm -hmm. okay a third of people all the time see themselves in the third person it's really right. common right yeah yeah so that can't be that you're just looking at a photo that you had stored in the back of your mind it's a construction right. yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah i said to you think of something last week you thought oh I know, there was that time when me and my daughter and my husband went down and fed the ducks. So you see you, your husband and your daughter feeding the ducks. Yes. So it's almost like the things we see in our minds that we think are memories are an image that we tell ourselves happened on the basis of what we know mm -hmm. happened. Yes. Yeah. And yes. do you know what? It doesn't matter, right? Because 
you know, it, this isn't a court of law, okay? And mm -hmm. whether you were sitting there feeding the ducks or you were sitting there and your husband was there and it was Hovis or it's bad, it doesn't really matter, right? <laughs> but it does matter if you're going to cause yourself anxiety for the rest of your life based on you believing that actually happened the way you saw it. Yes. Okay. It's Absolutely. entirely constructive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Memory mm -hmm. for all of us is constructive. Whatever you think of as a memory, you have just created. You've just drawn it now based on some knowledge you have about it. So there cannot be, there isn't a memory of me, an image of me, a video of me being attacked by a pit bull when I was 10. That doesn't yep. exist. I yep. believe it does exist. It feels like it exists because 10 times a day when it gets triggered off, by a dog barking or something, it feels like, oh, God, it's that video again playing round and round and round, and I feel terrified, but it mm -hmm. doesn't actually exist. But it's my belief that it does exist that depowers me. Absolutely. Okay? Yep. The moment I get my head around the fact that it doesn't actually exist, I've just made that. It's in the present moment. It's not in the past. It's in the now. I've just created that now, mm -hmm. and I could choose not to create that. Right. It becomes really easy to change it. Yeah, yeah. You can okay. do something about really it. Really easy yeah. to change it. Mm -hmm. You can do something about it. It's not forty yeah. years ago when I got attacked by a dog. It's yeah. today when I create that image that matters. Okay, Absolutely. and I can create yeah. it a different way. I can change the language within it. I can change the the way I view it and the emotions with mm -hmm. which I view it. Okay, so that's the yeah. memory part of it. Okay, it yeah. doesn't exist. It's a recreation in the now based on something there's also research for example that, that that says that you recreate it differently every time you think of it depending on how you feel so if you're in a lovely good happy mood today and i say think of that picture of your wedding day puts a big smile on your face okay mm -hmm. if your husband's really annoyed you and you're in a bad mood with him today again okay, ask you to think about it you'll see it with maybe your shit tinted lenses on yeah. Oh, yeah it, was, yeah, it was a great day. Well, it was lovely, yeah, but we had a good time. So depending on how you feel today, because yeah. because you're the one painting the picture, right? Mm -hmm. So how you're feeling today is going to affect how you paint the picture. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Um, also, here's a funny thing. The more confident you are mm -hmm. that the picture you're seeing is very valid, the less likely it is that it's valid. So research from uh, um, the use of forensic memories and memory enhancing techniques and things like this say that in terms of uh, witness testimony, if you and I were involved in a minor car crash today and a hit and run, okay, mm -hmm. and we go to court to talk about it, and you were to say, Your Honour, I'm absolutely certain it was a blue Ford Escort, and I say, it looked like a, it looked like a green Citroen to me. Just because you're overly confident in what you saw doesn't make it any more likely that what you think happened happened. Mm -hmm. Just because you're confident about it doesn't mean it's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is some research to say. <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> cut that out. There's some <laughs> research to say that actually the less confident person, yes, being less biased in their recall is more likely to be correct. Right. So yes. there's loads and loads of stuff around memory. All they need to understand today is it's not about the past. It's that, that memory is not in the past. It's a construction that you're making today, and you mm -hmm. can change it. You can change. You can do something about it. Yep. You can do so. You can do everything about it. You can completely mm -hmm. change. You can rewrite it. Okay. Doesn't yep. matter how yep. many times over the years I've been terrified of dogs. How many times over the years you were terrified of being sick? Mm -hmm. Okay. They were constructive processes every time you were doing that in that moment. Mm -hmm. Now, the other part to this, which is equally important, if not maybe more important, is the emotional side to it, okay? Because mm -hmm. another really disempowering belief that most people have is that we somehow bottle up emotions, mm -hmm. okay? That our emotions are buried deep or bottled up in some way, shape or form, you know, in some way with any sort of phobia, like dogs, for example, would yeah. say that, you know, whenever the memory gets triggered off, all this emotion starts rushing to the surface. Yes. 
Okay. Bubbling up is language that's used a lot, isn't it? Well, coming to the surface bubbling, bubbling up. Bubbling up, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And there's, yeah. The, there's loads of sayings within the English language. You know, people talk about, when they talk about death, you know, his, his uncle died. But he's got a lot of anger coming up yeah. at the moment. Yes. There's a lot of yeah. emotions yeah. coming up, you know. Yeah. There's this, the hatred just pours out of him, you know. Oh, you've tapped yeah. into some emotions there. Yeah. As if our emotions are somehow, again, these these pockets a bit yes. like pockets of air when you're in an aeroplane, right? Yes. The pockets of emotions hidden around your body mm. somewhere. Yes. Oh, I found one. Or there's one spontaneously. You've got, yes. You've got to let it out. out. Of control. Let it out. You've, got to, you've got to let Release out. It. Let all those feelings out. Face up to those um, emotions that are buried yeah, yeah, yeah. beneath the surface. It's just not true. It's a metaphor. Mm-hmm. I understand why people talk like that because it makes sense to talk about it that way. But that's actually yeah. a really disempowering way of talking about it, right? Yeah. Our emotions are always in the present moment mm-hmm. okay we or any emotion you ever expect ever mm-hmm. you are creating now today mm-hmm. here and now right if if you get you know if we could think of that person that stole your car and we could get you feeling angry right now about that person that stole your car that's a brand new picture you've just constructed and that's a brand new uh, emotion of anger that you've just created because you're thinking about it and the unjustness of it or the injustness mm-hmm. of it okay 30 yeah. seconds ago it wasn't even in your mind you might not have thought about that for 10 years okay yeah it wasn't that the memory was bottled up in the back of your mind and the emotion was just there beneath the surface repressed somehow because it was so strong you yeah. just created it in that moment now this is massive if you mm. think about it Okay, it's absolutely Huge. massive yeah. because mm-hmm. even with such a strong phobia, uh, like a metaphobia, right? Or, or for me, the metaphor of a phobia of dogs, okay? It really does feel like mm. all this emotion coming up, all yeah. this emotion bubbling to the surface, all this That's emotion it, I've got to let out, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and, and mm-hmm. the language is always that the emotion isn't something I've got any control of. That it's it's just yep. it's there. It's it's like the weather. It's outside my control. Am I going to feel emotional today? Who knows? Am I going to be triggered off about a dog today? Nobody knows. It could happen. It might not happen. Maybe I'll hear a dog barking. Maybe someone's going to send me a text message. Ha! Ah, what's your podcast? Here's a picture of a dog. Okay. Yes. Feeling yeah. that these things are incredibly unpredictable, which in case they're not. Okay. Mm-hmm. The memory doesn't exist. I construct it new every mm-hmm. time. Yep. And every emotion that I experience, I've created in the now. Yep. Okay. Now this this is mm-hmm. this is really really important. I've created. Now. Doesn't matter how many times in my life I've been anxious and frightened and huddled in the corner of the room because there's a dog next door. Mm-hmm. Okay. It all depends on how I do that now. So if I feel powerful today, and I feel powerful about my past and powerful about dogs, immediately I'm no longer going to be scared Mm -hmm. or anxious. It's all in the now. Think about it. If what I've just explained is true, then I've had this phobia for 40 years, this hugely traumatic phobia, terrifying fear of dogs, which has been Mm -hmm. really disabling. Okay, And it's all been based on the belief I had intellectually that somehow this memory of being attacked by this dog has been bottled up. This short five-minute video has been there in the back of my brain somewhere all this time and occasionally just playing mm-hmm. playing the video in full technical and full sound without anything I can do about it. Uh, um, and I just feel completely disabled or disenabled by the whole thing and disempowered by the whole thing and there's nothing I could do about it and of course everyone I've ever spoken to over the years including my parents when I grew up add to it well of course it's because you were attacked by that dog yeah. you're just remembering yes. it's it's a, it's a PTSD reaction okay you're you know the video just plays and plays and plays because of all these things it's just not true mm-hmm. yeah. it's just not true okay mm-hmm. it's my mm-hmm. belief if I think about it I don't have a memory bottled up about the dog. I don't have emotions bottled up that are being siphoned off whenever I think about a dog. Okay, If that were the case, then a phobia would lessen, wouldn't it, every time you Mm -hmm. had it? Okay. If I've got got a certain amount of emotion bottled up by that dog scaring me 40 years Mm -hmm. ago, 
then every time I felt frightened and scared and cried, that emotion would disappear slowly, yeah. wouldn't it? You'd release okay. it. And a bit it doesn't. Of it, yeah. Yeah, it tends to get worse, not better, right? So it's not that. Yeah. Okay. So that narrative is untrue. So mm -hmm. age 50, Michelle, mm -hmm. traumatized all my life by this horrible debilitating phobia. What part or parts of me being brutally attacked by this dog when I was 10 mm -hmm. does still exist? What part of that whole traumatic six minutes? I mean, I've still got the scar on my leg, right? But what mm -hmm. part of that actually does still exist, is still real? The belief that I've built about it. The belief I've built about the experience and my ability to handle it. That's all there is. Mm -hmm. That's all there is. A belief about mm -hmm. dogs. Okay. Yep. What happened 40 years ago, I created in six minutes a really, really powerful belief that dogs are scary, dogs are terrifying. Mm -hmm. They want to kill you. It's awful. It's the worst thing in the world. Get away. That's my belief. Okay. And I've had that belief. Okay. I've had that belief for 40 years. Okay. So whenever I see or hear a dog, that's my belief. That's my response. I have a belief about gravity, right? Okay. It hasn't changed at all. My belief gravity is something goes up, comes down. Okay. <laughs> yep. And I've used that mm -hmm. belief all my life playing football and other ball games really, really badly. Okay, but that's a belief. Gravity yep. is a belief. Ghosts are a belief. These yep. things are beliefs, right? They drive yep. everything. Yep. People who've mm -hmm. got lots of social anxiety have a belief that people judging them is going to make them feel insecure and, and it's going to be painful and it's going to feel really uncomfortable. Okay, mm -hmm. and so they feel bad in social situations. It's not yep. that those things are affecting them. They just have a belief. Yep. So yep. all I had for 40 years ruining my life was a belief about dogs. Yes. When I changed yeah. my belief about dogs to most dogs are lovely and safe and cuddly and nice, they're not, they don't want to hurt me at all, certainly don't want to kill me, from that second onwards for the rest of my life or until I yeah. change the belief again, my interaction with dogs is lovely. had nothing yes. to do with a bottled-up trauma of being attacked by a dog. It was yeah. solely about the belief. And exactly the same thing goes for metaphobes. Yeah. It's the so going back to my, they have. Oh, go yeah, on, so go going on. back to the client that I had yesterday, right? So she believed it was her upbringing and things in her past and the relationship she has with you know parents, things like that that have happened that caused her metaphobia. But her brother, who was witness to the same thing, didn't have that. All of what we've said today confirms that and supports that, that it's it's – not the thing in the past because if it was the brother would have it so i guess my question if i was playing devil's advocate and i'm trying to um predict people who are watching this podcast what their thoughts might be mm -hmm. so they would say well why then why has my client or why did i because i did the same right why did i yeah. go on to develop a metaphobia when my sister didn't when my client's brother didn't right because it's the same thing why did that happen why did I form that unhelpful belief and that other person didn't? Okay, that's even easier, okay? Yeah. So there are lots of people that have been bitten by dogs that don't have phobias of dogs. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, most people probably that have ever had a dog have been at least nipped by it at some point, yes. either intentionally or accidentally, yep. and they don't have phobias of dogs, right? So it all depends right. yep. on your on how powerful you feel before the event how you're going to experience the event. I'll give you another example. Mm -hmm. I was talking to someone earlier about this. Mm -hmm. Most people my age, 50, 55 actually, I was only using 50 for the sake of argument, right? Most people my age, 55, and have been driving <laughs> for 30 odd years, have had at least one mm -hmm. ding in their car, okay? Maybe not a big thing, not, not a big crash on the motorway, but they've backed into a lamppost or they've skidded into somebody, right? I don't know anybody with a phobia of driving. Some are metaphobes, yep. don't like driving on motorways, but that's about control and the fact they can't get off. I don't know that's anybody control. that's got a phobia of driving, okay? Yeah. What happens is you get yeah. back in the car, mm -hmm. you're nervous and anxious, within 10 minutes, half an hour, you feel back to normal again, okay? Yeah. So it's your attitude towards mm -hmm. the thing in the first place. So metaphobes, well before they ever developed a metaphobia, already had those 
unhelpful thinking styles, catastrophizing, right. negative, black and white thinking, all this kind of stuff, and already had, uh, um, uh, due to copying of, of other people, many parents, mm -hmm. difficult in regulating some of their emotions. Absolutely. Okay? Yep. So then when they, they start to develop this emetophobia, instead of thinking about it in a powerful way, instead of thinking about it in a problem-solving way, I can get over this, I can get around this, I'm going to defeat this. It's instead, I've got to run away from this. This I cannot deal with this. The feelings that that thing is making me have are so uncomfortable, so painful, I've got to run away. Yeah. And they've run away all their life. Yeah, absolutely. And every time you run yeah. away, it gets bigger. Yeah, That's absolutely. It. Yeah, yeah. So if I may just put it in context just to make it, even more concrete and even more real for the listeners. When my phobia started, if that's the language you want to use, when I started developing emetophobia was around the time of my parents' divorce. So obviously my sister was in the same family and going through this, exactly the same thing. And looking at it for, based on what we've said today, it was never the divorce that created the emetophobia. It was never the circumstances around it and everything else that went on. It was how I thought about it and it was the beliefs I built about it moving forward. So, you know, we, me and my sister would both have experienced the same situation, but I'd have catastrophized it. She wouldn't have done, potentially, right? I'm yeah. glorifying my sister here, but just for, for, you know, sake of argument, I'd have brooded about it, I'd have thought about it, I'd have tried to solve that problem and find a way around it. She wouldn't have done. So it was how I was looking at it, my thinking styles, my beliefs that I had. You know, I don't like uncertainty, for example. I've got to make things certain. So what can I do with that desire for control? My sister doesn't have that. So it's yeah. all of that and, that and how I responded in my thinking styles that created my metaphobia, not the divorce, which answers also, my client's question also, today. Yeah, and also maybe everything else in your life could have happened a, a year before, even before your parents got divorced. And you may not have developed emetophobia. It may have been mm -hmm. the extra pressure and stress of your mm -hmm. parents going through a divorce that was mm -hmm. enough to put you on the back foot. It could be a thousand different things. But the point of the matter is, you're absolutely right. It's the way you are experiencing it through your yeah. beliefs and your things. And we know this from the, any twin studies, okay? Even with identical mm -hmm. twins have entirely different experiences. It's not about the reality. It's about how you are experiencing something through your filters, through your lenses of your beliefs yes. and uh, your thinking yes. styles. Yeah. Yes. Which um, is all at the on. same time confronting and empowering. So when you're, you know, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, crikey, hang on a minute, you've got to take responsibility for all of that. You might go down the road if you're in the habit of blaming yourself. You say, well, it's all my fault then. All right. And you, you're going to lower your own self-esteem and blame yourself for these things. It's not a blame game. You don't, you have no control over these things because you don't know they exist. If you don't understand how you're thinking and, and what habits that you are in, you can't hope to change them. You can't hope to manage them. So it's certainly not a blame thing. And it's not something to beat yourself up with and beat yourself over the head with at all. But it is worth taking it as that is so powerful because I can learn about this. I can understand it. I can then do something about it. I can change it. It's not happening to me. So it's that one confronting and empowering. Absolutely. hundred percent. You know, it's, it's, you know, I was just thinking then there's so much in the English language and entire, you know, therapies are all based on the belief and corroborate the belief that it is about the past. It is about those things. Those still, those things are still haunting you today. No, they're not. No, they're not. The beliefs mm -hmm. you have about them are. And a belief's not hard to change. Mm -hmm. Belief's not mm -hmm. hard to change at all. Okay? And I don't mean to be facetious with your audience, right? But the vast majority of people listening to this podcast probably really, really believed in Santa Claus when they were young. Right? Probably mm -hmm. really, really believed it. Okay? And then one day they woke up, age 10, 11, 12. Sorry if there's any kids listening, by the way. Okay. You know, warning to parents. Yeah, I was just thinking that. We'll put a woke little up, star, a little asterisk, yeah, not for kids. Yeah. Woke, <laughs> woke up at 11, 12, and they didn't believe anymore. Right? And they didn't believe anymore. And do you know what? They've never gone back to believing. You've never heard of a 30-year-old going back to believing, right? The moment they were confronted mm -hmm. with the evidence that their belief was untrue, they are massively disappointed, Okay. 
And from that moment onwards, they've never believed in Santa anymore. And yet when they did believe, they really believed. And then yeah. press of a button, they don't believe anymore. Okay. If you speak to Lisa, who's got lots of videos, of when she had hematophobia, mm. and we know that in the end she overcame it in three days, boom, it's like a, it's like a, 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 a mm. switch. And in fact, it wasn't three days. Mm -hmm. It was a moment within those three days. I know you did a podcast yeah. last week with... Um, with uh, Bree, didn't you? I Who did. overcame it by herself in three weeks, I think, with just a manual. Okay? Yes. You change yes. the belief, you then change all of your responses and your emotions and your thoughts and feelings that were based on that belief. The belief mm -hmm. is everything, or the set of beliefs is absolutely everything. The problem we have with yes. any phobia is people believe their emotions, right? And feelings aren't facts. And that's the mm -hmm. hardest thing, to challenge those emotions. Just because you feel yeah. really strongly about it doesn't mean it's real. Yep, absolutely. Fabulous. I think we should Thank leave you. that there for today because we're going to go okay. down another tangent. I think that was brilliant. Okay. Thank you. It's been I'm great. Just looking, Fabulous. Just looking right. here. Some, some, sorry, some of the quotes of it here, right? I've got like eight yep. of the most well-known therapists uh, uh, in the world, right? All of them talking about emotions in a powerless, unhelpful way. That Here's Freud, for example. Unexpressed, emo unexpressed emotions will never die. They're buried alive and will come forth later in uglier ways. Right? That's Freud. Mm -hmm. Gabo Mate talks about the cost of suppressing your emotions. Brenny Brown talks about the emotions that you're unwilling to feel. Mm -hmm. Okay, as if these things exist separate to you like the weather you, yeah. like you don't know what the weather's going to be tomorrow right it's going to happen and you just got to deal with it and that's not the reality of it you create your emotions yes. it new every single time by the way in which you are viewing it which is based upon your beliefs and whatever lenses or glasses you're wearing that day absolutely Big one to get your head round, but worth it. If you are still sat here wondering and going, I'm not sure about that, go and find the research. It's all there. It's okay. all there. Have a look at the research. All right. Perfect. Right, lovely. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.